All right, you guys. So we're moving on to lecture number dose um, with our toxicity and water pollution. All right. Um, and we kind of wrapped up as much of chapter 7 as we're going to cover. So we are delving into chapter 22, which is our chapter devoted to water pollution specifically. All right. Uh, now, I want to start with some vocab with you guys. All right. And the reason for that is... Uh, many of the types of water pollution cause certain changes in uh, the water, right? And these couple of vocab terms I'll introduce you guys to uh, are kind of paramount to understanding what those those changes entail, okay? Uh, so the first term we're going to discuss here is the, the term oligotrophic, right? And oligotrophic bodies of water are those that, um, well, they're really common here in the Northwest, okay, with their... Uh, low nutrient levels, all right? And uh, one of the things you need to maybe get clarified right away is when we talk about nutrients and enrichment in water, uh, that generally is not a good thing, all right? But um, we'll put that in context in a little bit. But for right now, understanding oligotrophic bodies of water, this is Crater Lake, by the way. If you guys ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. But um, oligotrophic body water, they have low nutrient levels. They're really clear water, so there's really great light penetration. Um, and one of the things we see in our oligotrophic bodies water is high dissolved oxygen. Deep water, there's not a lot of algae, right? And then the types of fish that we see living in there are, you know, your smallmouth bass and lake trout and sturgeon and whitefish, okay? So really common up here in, in the western part of the U.S. and the northwest specifically. All right. Now, um, also common, but maybe not as common around here, uh, much more common maybe like in the south, um, are eutrophic bodies of water, right? So eutrophic bodies of water are those that um, have really high nutrient levels, all right? And because there's lots of nutrients in the water, we get lots of this beautiful-looking algae growing, okay, uh, that covers the surface. And because of that, we get relatively poor light penetration, relatively low dissolved oxygen level levels, shallow waters, uh, and the types of fish that we would see in these types of um, streams or, or streams or ponds or lakes would be like carp and bullhead and catfish. Okay? Um, so, again, we want to be able to contrast oligotrophic with eutrophic bodies of water. Okay? Oligotrophic or clear, high dissolved oxygen, low nutrient levels. Eutrophic are not clear. They're murky, high nutrient levels, low dissolved oxygen, and they're often uh, accompanied with these algal blooms, okay, that kind of cover the surface of the water. All right. Um, so both bodies of water, there, there's actually um, nothing wrong with eutrophic body of water, right? That is perfectly fine if that's the, the natural state of the lake or stream or pond, okay? Um, and the reason that's fine is the, the plants, the organisms, and the animals and the aquatic life are adapted to those conditions. So like catfish and carp, they survive and, and in fact thrive in those conditions, all right? Um, but what we worry about is this eutrophication of what are normally oligotrophic bodies of water, all right? And um, with that happens here is we take a normally uh, clear, high dissolved oxygen environment, good light penetration, low nutrients, and somehow that body of water gets enriched, okay, um, with, you know, uh, some sort of nutrients. And the most common culprits there are sewage or fertilizer runoff, okay. Uh, what that does is that kickstarts a process where uh, because we boost the nutrient level of water, we also get a big boost in the amounts of algae that survive. So algae eats up those nutrients and goes crazy, right? Uh, and the result of that algal growth is as that algae grows and then dies, bacteria then come in and consume that algae, right? And in the process of decomposing that algae, they consume much of the oxygen in the water, right? So our what they call biological oxygen demand. So when it goes way up, so when we introduce uh, excessive nutrients, 
or, or enrich a body of water with nutrients, okay? That kickstarts the whole eutrophication process where uh, nutrients go up, algae growth skyrockets, all right? Bacteria come in and decompose that algae, right? And because we have bacteria doing the decomposition process, our demand, what they call BOD, which stands for biological oxygen demand, right, goes way up. But there's a larger demand for oxygen. That means we're using more oxygen, right? And the result is a big, rapid decrease in our dissolved oxygen, all right? And when you have organisms from those oligotrophic bodies of water that are not adapted to those conditions, we get a rapid and mass die-off of uh, the aquatic life in that area, all right? And... Um, so, I wanted to get these vocab terms in place. Oligotrophic versus eutrophic. Both are fine if that is their natural state. Our concern is the eutrophication of where naturally oligotrophic bodies of water. Alright? Uh, we will revisit this um, a few times, but we just wanted to get these in place for now. Alright, moving forward. Um, so, types of water pollution. Okay, so when we talk about water pollution, we're talking about a physical or a chemical change in water that adversely affects the health of humans and or other organisms. And of course, the amount of water pollution and severity is going to vary by magnitude and location. All right. Uh, it is important that we understand that a physical change is not the same as chemical change. So we're not always talking about chemicals being added to water. We could be talking about a change in the water's temperature, right? Uh, and that also affects things like dissolved oxygen, affects metabolic rates and respiration in fish and so on. Okay? Uh, so it's not always a chemical change. It could be physical. All right? Um, and also worth pointing out, at least for right now, the major, major water quality issue globally is access to disease-free water. Right? So the number one issue uh, people face with terms of water quality is uh, lots of water has lots of nasty, nasty critters in it, okay? Not as big of an issue in the U.S., um, but particularly in a developing world, all right? And uh, we are going to split up our types of water pollution into eight main categories. Uh, some of those categories actually sort of cause the, uh, the same thing to happen, right? A lot of it dealing with eutrophication, uh, but we will talk about each category separately. And we'll only get through a couple of those today. I don't want to take too much of your time talking at you guys. All right. Uh, so our first category is sewage. Really, really common um, in places that lack infrastructure uh, for managing uh, household waste or human waste, excuse me. Um, okay. So uh, release of wastewater from drains or sewers. Okay, so that includes human waste, okay, but of course it also includes soaps and detergents, anything that goes down our drain. So if you're taking a shower, for example, uh, hopefully the only stuff going down the drain is the water from the shower and then shampoo or soap or face scrub, whatever you guys use, right? Um, so these also uh, contain plant and algal nutrients sometimes um, along with human waste, okay? Um, are two kind of more serious environmental problems with uh, sewage uh, are enrichment and increase in biological oxygen demand. That should sound familiar to us because we just talked about what happens when we get an enrichment of a body, body of water. Enrichment often is used as a, a good term. We think we have positive connotations with enrichment. Not the case in, uh, when we're talking about bodies of water. Okay, so um, we, we essentially fertilize a body of water, right, uh, with plant and algal nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and those can come from uh, waste, uh, and also sometimes soap and detergent, right? When that happens, we begin that eutrophication process and the corresponding increase in biological oxygen demand. When the demand goes up, DOD goes up. The amount of available oxygen or dissolved oxygen goes down. Okay? Um, now, the other 
uh, major water quality issues that would be caused by sewage pollution, of course, is disease. All right, many of the diseases we talked about uh, uh, that are in water, and we'll talk about in more in detail later, uh, are uh, found in conjunction with human waste. Okay. Um, so, uh, graph. Okay, so this is uh, showing a sewage spill, right, in a stream. So our x-axis is the distance downstream from the sewage spill. So mile zero here will be where we have maybe a leaking sewer pipe. Okay, so what we should notice in this graph is uh, right at the location of the sewage spill, we see a big spike in our biological oxygen demand. All right. So again, I want you to think about okay, what's happening to increase the demand in oxygen, okay? Sewage contains lots of plant and algae nutrients, right? So we're going to get a big spike in our plant and algae uh, growth in that stream, all right? The result of that would be uh, an algal bloom, which as the algae dies, bacteria come in, begin to consume that bacteria, uh, consume the algae, using up a lot of the oxygen in the process. So the demand for oxygen is caused by the rapid decomposition of dead and decaying algae. Okay? If the demand for oxygen goes up, we see a corresponding decrease in the actual amount of dissolved oxygen. Alright? And so you'll notice uh, there's a certain level. Dissolved oxygen needs to be above a certain level to uh, to support aquatic life, right? So below that that line right there, we see fish kill. So um, here, around 50 uh, kilometers downstream from the the sewage spill, we see lots of fish deaths as a result. Okay. Now, as we move downstream, things get polluted, water gets churned up, that returns more dissolved oxygen to the water. So we are dissolved oxygen increase and the demand for oxygen begins to decrease as things get diluted, right? Um, but this is a pretty common type of graph that you see in uh, multiple choice questions about water pollution. It's just like the, the college board's favorite one for some reason. Anyways, uh, it's a good illustration of what can happen with the sewage spill, okay? Uh, moving forward, inorganic plant and algal nutrients. So essentially we are talking about fertilizers, right? So primary components of fertilizer are nitrogen and phosphorus because those are uh, really, really important nutrients for plants and growth of plants. Um, and uh, it's worth saying that judicious use of fertilizers, right? And, and taking care in how they're applied and where they're applied, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but when we have lots of runoff from agricultural fields, uh, we get a, a big boost in the available nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that gets into our waterways, right? Uh, so the primary sources of those would be, again, human and animal waste, plant residues, uh, atmospheric deposition under rare conditions, but the biggest one uh, in this case would be fertilizer runoff and then animal waste, all right? Uh, human waste would not be the number one cause of inorganic fat and other nutrients. Uh, mostly fertilizer runoff and agricultural fuels. Uh, by the way, the number one cause of water pollution in the U.S. specifically is agriculture. Alright? Uh, and again, what do we see with the enrichment of inorganic fat and, uh, fat and algal nutrients? Enrichment, a high biological oxygen demand, often creates some stinky conditions too, by the way. Uh, that's that eutrophication process that we mentioned earlier. All right. Um, the book talks about this uh, dead zone in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So the Mississippi uh, drainage basin, right, is enormous. Essentially, near well, nearly all the rivers east of the, the Continental Divide uh, feed into the Mississippi River, which eventually works its way out to the Gulf of Mexico there near. Uh, New Orleans. Okay, now what we have to remember is that the the Mississippi River drains a very very large area of agricultural land. Right, so we've got 
all this corn and uh, wheat agriculture, right? All those fields essentially run off and drain into the Mississippi River. And by the time we get to the mouth of the Mississippi River, we've got an excessively high concentration of those nutrients, right? And as those get out into the ocean, um, we get algal blooms again, that whole eutrophication process. And uh, this is where the book actually brings up a condition in water called hypoxia, H-Y-P-O-X-I-A, right? Or hypoxia. Uh, and those are conditions where the uh, oxygen levels are so low that most, if not all, of uh, the aquatic life can't survive where those algal blooms occur. All right? And it's also worth noting that the fishing industry is huge in this area, right? And so the effects of these farmers up in Iowa uh, excessively fertilizing corn are actually causing a decrease in aquatic life as far away as the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, one of those unintended consequences. All right? Um, and the last type of water pollution we'll talk about in this lecture is what we call thermal pollution. All right. Uh, so thermal pollution is not uh, a chemical additive, right? It's the result of industrial processes, typically, right? So uh, water has an extremely high specific heat, which we talked about back in other chapters, right? And because of that, it makes for a great heat exchange, a great heat sink. So we can use it for cooling things off, essentially, All right? So power plants, uh, nuclear power plants, especially. Uh, use massive amounts of water as a coolant, right? So they're not necessarily polluting the water with chemicals, right? They're using it as a heat exchange and heating that water up, all right? But uh, if the water's already hot, they, they can't use it as well as coolant, so they have to keep cycling in new, fresh, cold water and letting the warmer water back out into nature, all right? Um, the trouble with that is as you increase the temperature of water, the, its ability to hold dissolved oxygen decreases, and that's what this graph over here is showing us, right? So uh, the colder the water, right, um, the higher the dissolved oxygen content. All right, so the way to read this, so notice that right here is our warmest water temperature. That is our lowest dissolved oxygen, right? Over here, as we approach freezing, notice that our dissolved oxygen levels increase as uh, the temperature of water decreases. Now, uh, solids that we dissolve in water actually are more soluble at high temperatures. Gases are less soluble, okay? Uh, which, interestingly, is a little throwback to our climate change unit. Um, lots of CO2 that gets put in the atmosphere actually ends up in the ocean, and that causes that acidification that we talked about. Uh, but as oceans warm up, they're less able to hold carbon dioxide, and it could be that eventually the oceans start stop taking up so much carbon dioxide, more ends up in the atmosphere, which makes things even warmer. Uh, kind of a crazy possibility for a positive feedback loop. All right. Uh, the key thing to understand about thermal pollution, back to where we are now, is. Uh, it doesn't necessarily cause a chemical change. It lessens the ability of water to hold dissolved oxygen, which, as we know, not so good for the fishies that like dissolved oxygen. All right. Uh, that concludes this installment. Peace.